Hans team still have no evidence of what the phenomenon is or where it might be coming from. Some say that uh, there is something new mechanism in, in uh, physics. Uh, some claim that's a new part of our world uh, which we haven't uh, discovered yet. If you were to ask me if there is any credible explanation for the, the reported sightings over Hestalen, there's nothing that I know of in atmospheric science that can generate lights in the sky, at least insofar as we can tell from the photographs. Francisco Correa has come to the Castello de Bode Dam, where two witnesses observed the dramatic nosedive. There were two shepherds here who saw the airplane and saw it nosedive. And they saw it go, go below this hill over here, uh, and then they, they saw it, bah! When the, the, uh, the, the pilot turned off his engine and started to pull it off on again, uh, it, it, it made, bah! And they saw it the, then, the, the plane going just above, nice and easy. Dr. Greer is going to be uh, right on. Let's get him on the show, Dr. J. That's right, and we are bringing him on right now. Let's get Dr. Greer on. We're actually calling him live. That's air. right. I, I like this live, real-time action. Dr. Dr. Stephen Greer. Greer. Dr. Greer, welcome to the show. Third Phase of Moon Radio. You know, welcome to the show, Dr. Greer. This is uh, Blake Cousins, and uh, it's always good to have you back on Third Phase of Moon. The viewers are fascinated by uh, your knowledge, the Atacama alien, this contact in the desert. We're almost, we're almost up to giving $5,000 of uh, free tickets to the show, thanks to you. And uh, everybody's excited to show up at the Joshua Tree. I know last year's event was quite incredible. There was a person right here in Hawaii named uh, Reynolds Kamaka Vivioli. He's a kahuna. Uh, he claims he has contact with the Star family, and he predicted that night there would be a major triangle formation that was going to show up over the Joshua Tree, and uh, we put it out on third phase, and people claim that it really did show up the night you were there. Did you uh, witness yep. the triangle UFO, Dr. Greer? Yeah, we did, and in fact, um, it's interesting. We did a similar thing in Arizona a few years earlier, and a very beautiful tetrahedral um, uh, craft partially materialized. We've got a photograph of it. I believe it's on our website, seriousdisclosure.com, under the heading. If you go to, um, there's ET evidence, and then there's also CE5. But we have, you know, a number of images. I don't, I'm pretty sure that one is up there. Certainly it's in our collection. And what happened is that we were, there was a couple hundred people out uh, under the stars on this roof kind of terrace. And this same object, which is very, um, you know, in two dimensions, it would look like a, uh, a triangle, but in, it, you could actually see that it was turned, so you could see that it was a tetrahedron, which, by the way, for those of you who don't know, a tetrahedron is uh, four triangles. It basically, it's an equilateral triangle on each of three sides, and they make a triangular base. But, of course, if you don't have an up-and-down coordinate, it's just basically four triangular sides. And the, these shaped craft have been seen, you know, of course, for, I think, millennia. But um, we have had that happen, and sometimes they will be fully in this dimension and visible. Sometimes they'll only be visible with a good night scope, and other times you'll only see part of it. You'll see an edge of it. Um, in fact, when we were in, uh, uh, where were we? Uh, also in Arizona a couple months ago, we had one of these appear. But what you saw of it was like two points of light that were moving together. And as it moved, or area around it blocked out the other stars. And so you, the only part of it that could you see with the naked eye were these two points of light, like a but very large, moving right over the sky above us. And then, and we actually had some amazing video of this type of event happening when, during these contact events. And, and just so people know, a CE5 is when humans set up the conditions and invite contact as opposed to something that's an accidental sighting or what have you. So it's sort of a diplomatic initiative where we are welcoming them here within the aspect of uh, the oneness that's within us, which is consciousness and universality of mind. 
and that we think is the foundation for a future of universal peace. So in that sort of ethical and philosophical construct, we do these protocols, and it's amazing how often we have these sort of things seen. Doctor, you know, go ahead, Blake. Yeah, thanks, Doctor. The connection between man and uh, alien is quite uh, profound, especially when the Kahuna was here in Hawaii. You were over there in California, the Joshua Tree, and the prediction was there. And this connection, I think, is global, like you've been saying. But what about? See, we're working on a movie, Doctor Greer, about. It's called Hangar 52, and we're basing it on, on knowledge that we received from the people in regards to abductions, the sightings, uh, free energy. Is there a government cover-up? Is there a dark force? And we're thinking that is, is the government controlled by a dark alien race? No, <laughs> absolutely not. However, I mean, of course, it, it makes for a great conspiracy theory, and I think that... There's so much information that I think is disinformation out there on this subject. Uh, now, I mean, are there aspects of the government that are incredibly dark? Yes, but why do they need to be care, uh, controlled by a, an ET civilization? I mean, it's sort of a, I think it's the cop out that the people come up with not to take responsibility for our own uh, failings and shortcomings as human beings. And, uh, you know, <laughs> humans have been doing horrific things and dominating each other and engaging in warfare. Uh, for way too long, and I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a bridge too far to say that, oh, this is because there's some f force. Now, you, you can define perhaps evil as this kind of behavior, and if you want to look at it that way, you know, but to say that it's extraterrestrial is, I think, really, there's no basis for that at all. However, I think there are people, in, in, ironically, within the government programs who want people to believe that, because there's no way to... You know, how do you prop up a multi-trillion dollar military industrial complex worldwide? Um, and we're spending a trillion dollars in the United States alone if you all in with, with intelligence programs, Homeland Security, uh, black budgets, the Pentagon. How do you keep that kind of spending afoot if you don't somehow concoct a bigger enemy than, say, terrorism? And, and you, know, you know, Leon Panetta, who, who um, I put a briefing together for him when he was the CIA director um, for Obama, the his first CIA director, and, and you know, he, he at one point he said, look, we're spending, a, you know, a, over $100 billion a year chasing 70 al-Qaeda members in the desert of, of, of uh, Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. And, it, you know, how do you, how do you grow this sort of juggernaut and justify this kind of expenditure, which is, of course, impoverishing the world um, tremendously, without having a new enemy. And this is what, uh, you know, Carol Rosen and Werner von Braun, the, the guy who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, uh, told uh, Carol Rosen on his deathbed that basically that they were absolutely concocting events and trying to brainwash the public that there would be a threat from outer space even if it's only one or two species that we should then unite against, like the movie Independence Day, so we can, quote, kick alien butt, you know, qu quoting Will Smith in that movie. And, you know, I've spoken to too many people in the intelligence community, as well as Hollywood, who know that that's the agenda. But unfortunately, the UFO and New Age subculture have taken this stuff hook, line, and sinker. And in my sense, it's a really a tragedy of brainwashing. I wanted to ask you also, with Hanger... 52, we are trying to showcase the good side of humanity. And like you said, there is a dark and evil side of it as well. There's an equal point in the middle. And I guess that's why it's going to go on forever. But we are trying to uh, put a, a good light on things. But we also want to delve into, in the movie, Majestic 12. Dr. Greer, does it exist? Uh, well, you know, I mean, it's had various names since the 40s, and, you know, does that name still be the one? Would that still be the one that's current? I seriously doubt it. Um, was there a group, uh, 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 really, it's majesty and magic and some documents I have that are as recent as the 90s and, and the 2000s? Yes, it has existed. And uh, basically it's a committee, not just American, um, that has maintained the secrecy and the counterintelligence programs. Now, the disinformation and counterintelligence programs is a big part of it. And um, the people that, that I've uh, met with over the years, uh, and, you know, I have over 550 
people who worked in classified projects have dealt with this subject. And if you go to our website, we have several dozen that are actually on videotape talking. But you know, for every one that's on our website, there are at least ten that won't go on to an interview that I personally have met with. And, and what I, what you find as you put this mosaic together, it's, it's a whole complex picture you have to, to put together carefully, is that so much of the information on this subject has been quote unquote leaked by the intelligence community, but it's really pre-positioned disinformation that's designed to have a certain effect. One effect is to discredit the subject because it's just so ridiculous. The other, however, is actually to manipulate people with fear. And if you look at it, if you look at how demagogues, whether it's been religious leaders or political leaders or different kinds of, of uh, entities over the last uh, thousand, several thousand years of human history, is that one of the chief ways that humans have been able to be manipulated is to um, make them afraid of something that's, quote, other. So, you know, for a long, many, many years, it was one, you know, race or one uh, ethnic group. Uh, it's still today all over the world, look at the Middle East, one religious group against another. Uh, it may be one ethnic group. If you go to Africa, there are tribal groups. And, you know, Rwanda, you had the... the the Tutsis and the Hutus, that, you know, some like 800,000 people were butchered, um, you know, a decade or two ago. Um, and, and what you see with that is that there's a tendency for people to hate and be afraid of anything that's really different from them. And even if it's not very different, I mean, if you look for, in, for years in Ireland, you had Protestants and Catholics. Okay, here, they both, oh, they're all Christian, they're white. They're living on this little island, and they're blowing each other up like there's no tomorrow. So the, the problem with that is that people who are trying to get a lot of centralized power know that they can do that if they can set the populace against each other and play them off each other. And you know, there was an amazing book written some years ago about how in New Zealand the colonialists turned one peaceful native tribe against another so that they would enter into warfare, so that they would be weakened, so the colonialists could then dominate the entire area. And that kind of Machiavellian, very deceptive action is really what goes on. What's unfortunate is that the UFO subculture has become the chief vector or vehicle, you might look at it, for a lot of this terrifying information to come out so that there will be people in a camp of, uh, you know, oh, there are good ones and there are bad ones, and we're going to choose sides, and it's Star Wars all over again. I mean, this is like, uh, uh, you know, a wet dream, I hate to say that, for the intelligence community to have people, uh, you know, brainwashed this way. And I, you know, what I think that, you know, when I met years ago, I got a document. Um, it's in the film very briefly, Sirius, which you can see at our website, S-I-R-I-U-S is the name of the film, and, and it came out last year as the biggest crowdfunded film in history. And what happens is in this document, it was, although they didn't spend much time on it in the movie, I would have liked to spend more time, is that it was from the Strategic Studies Institute, and it was talking, this is 1996, about creating a global abduction cult and to simulate human uh, being abducted by aliens that would be done with very advanced aircraft and the stagecraft of creatures that look like aliens but aren't. And you know, this document is in black and white. And it's an authentic document describing this program. Now, you know, if, if that's all there was, I'd say, well, you know, that's interesting. But then I've met with so many men and women who've been in these projects. Um, I remember talking to a man who uh, had been in a program back in the 70s, uh, it was the late 60s and 70s, where they were doing this. And he says, oh, yeah, back then we didn't have as good a stagecraft, as they called it, as we do now. But we were able to get these anti-gravity devices and have people appear to be aliens. And they would use various chemical substances, electromagnetic weapons, and they would engage in various types of abductions and also mutilation events back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and for livestock. And he says we were doing that because we knew that that would make its way into the tabloid media and the UFO subculture and begin to start this, this slowly snowballing effect of fearing everything alien. So that's sort of how the game is played. It's been played for thousands of years by 
despotic uh, demagogues, whether they be religious figures or political figures. Uh, and there's always an agenda behind it. The agenda behind it is to manipulate people through fear. And I think that, you know, one of the big challenges of this era right now is for people to transcend and see through that. And it's like the old Who song, we won't be fooled again. And I, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people have been fooled. Uh, and the idea that these um, programs aren't very well funded and extremely sophisticated in the technologies they have, uh, you know, it's just a wrong idea. They are well funded, albeit illegally, and they are very sophisticated in the technologies they have and also in the ability they have to stage something and fool people. So I think you have to view so much of this with, a, with an eye of, it's sort of like, is it real or Memorex? You know, the old commercial years ago about the audio tapes. You know, is it actually an ET event, or is it something masquerading as ET or alien for the purpose of psychological warfare, like the Benowitz case uh, that everyone probably knows about the Air Force Office's special investigations case back in um, uh, the day in, in the uh, near Sandia National Laboratories in Kirkland Air Force Base, uh, where, you know, they really did stage not only a human abduction, but a whole series of things and documents to um, put people off the course. Now, what a lot of people don't know is what they were really trying to hide, aside from putting out the false information, is that there was a woman that uh, Paul Benowitz knew that had actually seen near Kirkland and Sandia a man-made anti-gravity propulsion device that looks like a UFO. And in order to sort of brainwash her into thinking that was not ours but alien, they set up this whole series of things that Richard Doty and others were involved in. And I think that this is a real problem because, you know, it, you, know you can't take things at face value, and when you do, you're going to find that you're just being played by some very sophisticated people who have a lot of experience manipulating mass markets and mass media and subcultures into a certain type of reactive or reactionary perspective. And, and I'd say, well, you know, you can never prove a negative. So you can never prove that there are no civilizations out there that may not have our best interest in, at heart. But let's say even if that were true, what's your response going to be? Is your response going to be more war, i.e. Star Wars, interplanetary systems that are going into war. Well, if you understand technologies that are these scalar electromagnetic weapon systems, you can take out an entire planet with a system like that. So if, not a, if, if hydrogen bombs and atomic bombs would leave the world uninhabitable, these systems are even worse than that. So there is only one path forward, and it's peace. And it's not as exciting as a horror film about aliens. It's not as titillating about finding a new group of people. You know, you can't overtly be a racist and you can't overtly uh, hate women or you can't. Now they're wanting to find a way that people can overtly hate something. Well, what's the next something? Well, it's another system out there, another star system that we have to hate. It's a very convenient thing. It's tragic, but it plays into this sort of collective experience of humanity in our recorded history of ethnic groups, religious groups, political groups going to battle, going to war. And you look at the last hundred years, you know, we've killed something like 200 million of our own species in warfare on this planet, um, and often for things that are just ridiculous. Um, and yet that is, that's something that is un unfortunately one of the chief organizing principles of the current world order is an us versus them military, industrial, centralized governmental complex. And if they really want to be able to take that to the next level, they've got to find another enemy. So this is, this is I think, what's really deeply behind so much of the information that tends to scare people and, and turn people into these sort of dualistic camps of us versus them. Now, Dr. Greer, we are an extremely primitive species with this tribal warfare. Like you just said, these 200 million people that were killed. And obviously the next step in, in, in evolution is people need to realize that you know we are the same because there's others out there. And isn't there some sort of federation, galactic federation out there that's awaiting us for to ask them? Or, or is it, are they waiting for us Absolutely. to have peace? Absolutely, there is. I mean, there, there, there is a, a very large network of interstellar civilizations that have been observing our development for a very, very long time. Now, 
my view on this, looking, you know, stepping back and looking at the last, say, 100,000 years, most of which isn't recorded, it's been a process of humans going from tribes to you know, city-states, you know, the, the, you know, Greece and the Trojans, and then going to nations and nation-building, and now to something resembling of an interconnected global society, although highly dysfunctional. And then the next step, obviously, would be to become inter-global, interplanetary. However, that ticket, to get to that next stage, the requirement is that you have become at least nominally civilized so that you're not murdering each other by the millions. We haven't made that leap yet. So unfortunately, our technology has advanced enormously, you know, from, you know, muskets and cannons and things of this sort in the 1800s and 1700s to a thermonuclear weapons and things that are classified weapons that are even more fearsome, as well as technologies that are very, very advanced. So we have developed technologies ahead of our social and spiritual development. And that is exactly the window. That's exactly the period when a species such as ours is at greatest risk, not only to ourselves, but I know I sound like a, a doctor here, but not only dangerous to ourselves, but dangerous to others. Now, interestingly, if someone comes into my emergency department, I'm an emergency doctor by training, who's a danger to himself or others, they get committed to, to a mental facility. And, you know, I had a friend who was a Harvard psychologist. He was hilarious, and he had had an encounter outside Washington that was amazing. And he said to me, he said, yes, well, the Earth right now is the intergalactic insane asylum because we're all we're acting completely like a bunch of crazy people. And I said, yeah, I know. So, you know, the, one of the things is we have to become nominally sane. And it's not that we're going to all become perfect or enlightened. I'm not, and I doubt anyone listening is. However, we can at least stop murdering each other by the millions and setting up these systems that uh, are designed to manipulate people into larger and larger and more and more expensive battles. And I think that's something that can only be changed by the people because there's so much power uh, that is centered at the top of this uh, food chain. Uh, of exactly what Eisenhower warned us about, the military-industrial complex, which is now the military-industrial financial laboratory uh, you know, research complex. And at the deepest levels of it are folks who really do want to be able to maintain control over not just American or British population, but a global population by presenting an existential threat that is not human. And I think that drives so much of the agenda of the false information, the concocted cases, the stagecraft. Now, have there been people who have been horrible victims of this? Yes. And you know, a lot of people, when they've heard me say this, say, well, you're not very sympathetic to people who've been injured or abducted. I said, no, I'm very sympathetic. Where I differ is, is the conclusion of who's doing it and what's behind it. Uh, there was a physicist who used to work out at um, Pine Gap, uh, the facility near Alice Springs in the center of the continent of Australia. And a um, brilliant man, and he was talking to me about how they had been manufacturing for years these creatures that look like aliens, but they're actually man-made kind of bio-nanotechnology creatures that have been used in abductions and have really been very persuasive um, for a lot of people thinking that uh, that they had an encounter with an, an alien when it was actually something that people were making that was some excellent, excellent uh, stagecraft. And I say excellent in the sense of very well done, but diabolical and, and absolutely evil. And, and so I think that, you know, until you get a, you know, do a really good research on this and, and begin to drill down that, you know, since the 80s there have been people who have concluded that, uh, you know, it's not just MK Ultra at the CIA that was doing experiments on people. There are all kinds of experiments that have been done with some technologies that most people wouldn't believe humans have. But it's because they're assuming that the technologies they know about, such as might be at MIT or Caltech or Oxford or Cambridge, that that's the state of the art. It is not the state of the art. The state of the art of the technologies are unpublished in deep black projects that are in these underground facilities near Edwards and the Nellis Range, what people call Area 51, but you know, nobody in the business calls it that. But, and these technologies that are 
in the hands of the big corporate titans, such as Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and SAIC and E-Systems and Raytheon and on and on and on. Those technologies are highly classified and are, you know, most people, if they were to see them displayed, would say, oh, that's got to be alien. Well, it's not. It's just that they don't know how far these technologies over the last 50 years uh, of studying, not just science in general, but also recovered and downed ET craft, have advanced, and they are substantial. So this substantial growth in technology that's classified uh, and is not known by the general public would almost certainly fool anyone who would see it. I remember back in the early 90s, it was after I briefed the CIA director for Bill Clinton, I had a man pull me aside and he said, you know, we have technologies that are so good that if we want to have somebody have a conversation with their personal God, a Jesus, a Buddha, whoever, they'll have it, they will think it's real, and they will pass a lie detector test that it happened to them. He looked at me square in the eye. This guy, I mean, it was chilling. And I said, what are you talking about? At that time, I thought this has got to be nonsense. And he went through a lot of this, and I went, oh, my God. I mean, you know, and this is why, you know, research on this issue is not simple. It's like um, it's like a, an onion you pull back, and you, 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 know, you pull back 38 layers, and you think you've reached the core of it, and you've got 50 more to pull back. So it, it's a, not a simple issue. Let me ask you this, Dr. Greer. You're saying that the technology is so superior right now that they can mimic an alien abduction, mimic uh, UFO flights and anti-gravity and this. But when you're doing your summoning events and having your CE-5, could this be possible again, technology that might be man-made and you might be, uh, you know, being deceived again? Oh, absolutely. We, in fact, we've had both happen on the same week-long training event. Um, but by the way, I just want to mention to people, there are two spots still available for the week after the Joshua Tree event. You know, we're going to do the thing that Sunday night's open to the public. Then we're going to do a small team training for an entire week up in Joshua Tree that begins that night and goes for an entire week to the following Sunday morning. Um, and that's limited to, I think, about 25 people. But there are two p spots left, so if anyone has that week and wants to do it, they can go to seriousdisclosure.com and find out. But we have had that happen. I'll give you a great example. One time we were up in a, um, a lot, you probably know where Sedona, Arizona is, and we were up in that area, and we had an amazing sighting and contact with actual ET craft and these translucent beings that were around us, very ET. The craft were seamless, this and that. And then later we had a disc fly over, but it had two jet fighters escorting it that was 100% man-made. It was a man-made anti-grav um, that was going from the south to the north. I suspect it was headed up towards um, the, the Provo area, the Dugway Proving Grounds, which is an underground area there south of Provo that's this, one of the state-of-the-art facilities now in America. Um, most people don't know about They always think of Area 51. I say, yeah, that was a cool place in the 60s and 70s. But um, so... This this event, everyone there, there are like 30, 40 people there looked up and they said, what the hell is this? I said, well, that's one of ours. So, yeah, I think people have to have enough knowledge. And I think this is one of the things that we, I try to train people when I do these um, expeditions with them is, is to say, look, here's the, the characteristics of an actual interstellar trans-dimensional uh, extraterrestrial vehicle and these beings. Here's what we have that I know about that are classified project projects, there, there are distincting, distinguishing characteristics. Now, if it's too far away and there's not enough information, you have to say, well, gee, I don't know if that was one of ours or one of theirs. Um, um, and I think that, but if you don't even have that, you know, in medicine we talk about differential diagnosis so that if somebody has chest pain, you know, there are like 115 things that that can be. One of them is a heart attack. But if you don't know about uh, the other 114 other things, you're going to miss a dissecting thoracic aneurysm, which is, of course, what killed Princess Diana. So you have got to have enough knowledge and information. What I find is uh, sort of a difficult in the UFO subculture is that it, people aren't drilling down at the depth that they need to 
because the people studying new energy and anti-gravity and secret aircraft uh, programs don't give much, some of them don't even think any of it's ET. A lot of the people involved with the ET and so-called alien issue don't know about the other. You really have to put all of it together in a comprehensive bit of information. And this is what I've been trying to bring forward. Uh, it, it's difficult because people want simplistic answers, but um, it ain't simple. If it were simple, this problem would have been solved before I was born in the 50s. So I think that's why we as a people have to begin to say, this has got to be childhood zen now. We have to have a mature understanding of this issue, uh, but not only in terms of how interstellar civilizations might appear in our time and space and how we might make contact with them, but what are the capabilities within the deep black programs at the Lockheed Skunk Works inside the, what's called the Cube, the big underground cube area uh, near Edwards Air Force Base? What are the capabilities within... Um, you know, out at Pine Gap in Australia, what are the capabilities that are electromagnetic weapon systems or systems that could simulate an event? You have to know all of this in order to actually go out there and understand what's happening. And if you don't have that comprehensive amount of information, uh, you're really, it's like a blind, blind man holding on to an elephant, you know, and you may be holding on to the back end of it. You know, you, you mean, so I think it's, it's, it's a complicated issue. It's not insurmountable, but one can't take a facile, um, and it's not a trivial issue to, to get all this information around into a comprehensive paradigm. And that's what I didn't know 24 years ago when I started the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Worldwide Disclosure Movement. I, I knew about some of this, but between 1990 and, ni and, the, and the year 1998 or so, I went through a very steep learning curve uh, from people who were on the inside of these projects. I mean, as you know, I have an uncle who was Northrop Grumman and worked on the lunar module, the thing that put the first man on the moon. So I had a lot of contact. When I began to learn what our capabilities were that were classified that are 100% human, I went, oh, my God, this is a really complex issue. It's not as simple as people think. So when... I know we, Dr. J, and we have some guests on the line that want to get some questions into you, Dr. Greer, like Johnny Webb, all the way from the U.K., but I wanted to get this in. Uh, the false flag event, is it on or off the table by the powers that may be a major invasion, CNN post it, and then there it is. Everybody knows that. Here, here's the extraterrestrial. We know we're not alone. Is this on the table, off the table, and, and how are you going to know if it's not uh, – it's not legitimate if it's one of ours or if it's the real deal. Well, first of all, the interstellar civilizations have no need to invade here. I mean, I think, with all due respect to Zachariah Sitchin and others, no civilization needs to come here to get anything we have here. We don't need to be turned into slaves digging up gold. If you understand the technologies of interstellar travel, you can materialize any element, any material you want, through resonance field frequencies, and I can get into this later if you want to talk about it. Um, so this is not something that, you know, there's no real reason to come here. Uh, and by the way, they estimate there are 11 billion Earth-like planets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which is one of billions of galaxies. So anything that's here on this planet is abundant throughout the universe. So there's no need, if you can travel from one star system in one point in space-time to another by going beyond the speed of light through these other dimensions, there's no reason that there'd be that kind of an event that would be for their own self-interest, number one. Number two, the, the, what you ask about this false flag event, what people haven't understood about what I'm talking about is that that event has been going on for 50 years. In other words, since Eisenhower lost control of these covert projects in the 50s, they have been putting out disinformation that has been tailored to create within the Hollywood, science fiction, and UFO subcultures this sort of aura of fear and of alien evasion and fearing all things alien. And I think this is uh, something that people don't understand. It's a long-term project. What so Werner von Braun, when he was talking about this, uh, he was talking about it you know, in 1974. That was 40 years ago. So it isn't like this is something that's just like a singular event that's going to happen. 
it's an ongoing disinformation and counterintelligence project that all of us have been victims of. That's are they going to get it on two. a world scale, though, like CNN all at once? Is that on the table? Or they, that, that, sure, that's they're not... something that, that I would say that's something that's possible in the future. Uh, and I think people would have to be very, very careful about how they evaluate what's going on. I mean, you know, I wish we had been so ca- careful about the claims about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before we went up and, and, dan- and completely dissembled that country. And look what we have now, probably what's going to become the biggest uh, terrorist and radical state in the entire world, much worse than Afghanistan. So I think that what people have to begin to do is they need to question this. And if it's on CNN or any other major network, you really need to question it, I hate to say it, because, you know, those guys uh, are often just basically uh, taking dictation from the right hand of the king. And I'm quoting, you know, that what I just said, taking dictation from the right hand of the king, is what a very good friend of Mike Wallace at 60 Minutes told me up in New York back in the 90s, a guy named Schwartz. And uh, Schwartz, this guy told me, he said, look, he says, I used to think we had a free press. He says, you know, and he, he had been dealing with Mike Wallace on some of this stuff, dealing with these majestic documents and other things way back in the 80s and 90s. He says, what I found is that basically the big media cannot cover and will only portray things that they are ordered to do because they're corporatized. And those big media corporations are vertically and horizontally integrated into the system. So, you know, I think that uh, something certainly could be done like that. Now, the other th- issue is that you can have an authentic ET event, and it could be spun into something that is an invasion. For example, I'll give you a great example. Um, back during the darkest days of the Cold War, as you know from the Disclosure Project witnesses, that many of our intercontinental ballistic missile, our nuclear missile silos, and facilities were overflown by ET craft. A number of cases where, like in Minot, North Dakota, uh, where you had 16 to 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, thermonuclear weapons, that were rendered unlaunchable all at the same time. Now, at the same time that, the same era when that was happening, Sam, I remember talking to Sam Donaldson of ABC News about this, that, that was going on in the Soviet Union with their nuclear weapons, but in a different way. And basically, what one of the, a captain who was there in the Air Force at Minot, North Dakota, said he really felt that the ETs were saying, don't blow up this beautiful planet. But if you do launch, know this, we can intervene so you don't destroy all life on Earth because this Earth is precious. He really got that vibe. And I said, well, of course that's what they were saying. If they wanted to come in and just invade and sanitize the whole Earth of all this stuff, they could do that probably in a couple of nanoseconds. The problem is that would look like an invasion. So it's sort of a catch-22. They're waiting for us to fix this problem because if it's done from outside, number one, we're not going to learn any lessons and evolve. And number two, it will be portrayed by these special interests as an invasion when it isn't, when they're simply trying to help or prevent something disastrous. So I think we have to look at this in a much wiser way than the sort of the, I don't know, the paranoiac and sensationalism uh, that, that permeates this issue right now. And, and that's one of the more difficult things for people to accept because to be thoughtful about this is, is really difficult and to be reactionary is predictable, but cliché. Dr. Greer, we got a break in a couple minutes, but uh, real quick, I wanted to give Blake any last words before he goes. Well, certainly, we're going to be uh, getting on location and working on our latest uh, production. It's a feature-length film. Everybody uh, to, uh, keep an eye out for it, Hangar 52. And, yeah, Dr. Greer, I, I think you're going to do what you, you, you're going to see in this film. Maybe you don't quite know the angle we're going to go at it. But definitely, it's uh, it's not a horror movie, but it is a thrill ride, and it's inspirational for humanity. Uh, do you think there's good people in in power that you know they're looking out for the human race, and that's why uh, everything's still you know still together? Everything's not falling apart yet. Are they still in control? Well, control is a very big word. I would say there are certainly good people in all walks of life um, who want us to make it through this challenge, and 
Uh, you know, a few months ago, I was on an island out off the coast of Australia with 120 uh, leaders from around the world. And, you know, there were at least 10 or 20 percent of those people who were very enlightened, very concerned about the public, the organizers of this event, uh, which is sort of a more elite thing like Davos or the World Economic Forum, um, are enormously supportive of what we're trying to do with the CE5 initiative and disclosure and bringing out these technologies for peaceful use. So, And these were some of the most powerful and connected people in the world. Now, with that said, there were probably half the people who were there who I thought were going to hurl me into the Coral Sea in the Great Barrier Reef and drown me before I got off that island. Um, the, 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 the hate stares were ended, you know, oh, my God. I mean, it was painful, actually. But, um, but the, the, you know, I'm used to that. I mean, you know, it's, I'm used to being the person people love to hate. But I Dr. think that... Uh, you know, we're going to go to break. Everybody stand by. We have Dr. Greer, the man himself. Stay tuned. Third Phase Moon. We'll be right back. Exciting interview so far with uh, the world-famous Dr. Greer. Uh, and we're going to be asking him about the Atacama alien because, go, go ahead, John. I was going to say, we're going to bring him right back. You let me know when we're bringing him right back. But it, we need to announce the winner of the oh, okay. contest. Uh, the winner, wow. yes. Uh, did you want to do the honors of what I sent you? Uh, you go ahead, Dr. J. The winner of this week's ticket. Remember, all tickets valued are $5,000. We are giving them here exclusively through Third Phase of Moon and on Revolution Radio. And the winner this week is Stephen Einpar. Again, Stephen Einpar, if you are out there listening, uh, call in or you watch for an email from Blake Cousins or, and, of course, the Contact in the Desert people. If you want to be next week's winner or and, and every winner we have every Thursday this month, go to contactinthedesert.com slash Third Phase of the Moon exclusive contest. Play Congratulations, Stephen, and uh, if you're out there at Contact in the Desert, Joshua Tree, the event, Dr. Greer will be there. They'll be uh, doing the CS5, communicating with the extraterrestrials, and if you capture anything amazing, send it to Third Phase of Moon via Skype or Facebook. We'd love to share it to the world, and we're working on this exclusive movie, Hangar 52, in regards to the UFO abduction phenomenon, world government conspiracies about covering up technology. That could save the world, make uh, energy free all around the world. Things could change. But we also wanted to get Dr. Greer on. Ring him up, Dr. J, because this, we wanted to ask him some incredible questions about the Atacama alien. And it's going to be incredible hour or two coming up because Absolutely. only right here at Third Phase Moon. I'm going to give him the chance right. to uh, finish about the cabal. Uh, Dr. Greer, welcome back. We are live on Revolution Radio. And right before we went to break, you were cut off. Yeah, sorry, when the music comes on, the uh, show is on break and out uh, over. No but problem. you were talking about uh, you know, the, the cabal. And I wanted to ask you, the, you know, finishing with what you were saying, what can we do to dethrone these, uh, these people that are controlling us? And as you were explaining, uh, the, the false people that are creating the false flags. Well, I think that we have to just create another reality. In other words, if you take on a center of power like that, you're giving in and giving them more power. So what you, if you do it directly, what you do is, while not totally ignoring them, you go forward with a positive initiative uh, and do it notwithstanding their existence. And this is a sort of a, a strategic Aikido uh, that really will work. And, of course, that if you look at the history of uh, Gandhi or Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, many things, that's basically what they did. Uh, you know, they did not go and attack, you know, directly in some sort of confrontational conflict, uh, the British in India. But they came together as a people and asserted that they wanted to have uh, this through a nonviolent and peaceful Effort. Same thing with Martin Luther King, and of course I grew up in, in the South during that era and was involved with those events. And I think that, you know, we have to learn that the way to make this happen is to come together as a people, know that there is this threat out there and be, have our eyes wide open, but then go ahead and create our own community of peace, our community of contact, attempt to come together and bring these technologies out even though there are great forces that would like us not to, and 
start anew our civilization. It isn't going to happen, I think. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, in my case, if I get invited to a meeting with a lot of people, some of whom are really, quite frankly, sociopathic uh, leaders or people, and my view of it is that I view every person as someone who is educable. I go there without prejudice, and I've been surprised. You know, I mean, there have been some people that I would have assumed would have been dead set against everything that we're advocating who are actually very supportive. Uh, and then vice versa, people that would appear to be uh, very progressive and open-minded who are actually uh, fronting for a cabal, and they just put that on as a, as a mask. So, you, you know, you really kind of have to take each individual as, as they really are, but I think that the real way to do it is to do what we're doing through the Global CE5 initiative, disclosure, where, I mean, you know, oh, when we first launched the Disclosure Project and, and the Worldwide Disclosure Movement uh, 13 years ago, it, what was interesting about that is that almost uh, over 800 million people around the world heard about it. It was on every network in the world. Now, the big corporate titans that are tied to the intelligence community took it down, but people learned. And now if you go all over the world, the majority of people around the world believe we're not alone in the universe and are being visited. Uh, in fact, the last year a poll came out, 43% of Americans uh, think that we are currently being visited, but a majority of Americans think we have been visited by intelligent life. So, you know, in a sense, we've, that, we, we've, we've accomplished that. The, the question becomes, how do you organize into some constructive effort? And that's where this whole concept of uh, what, what, what we call citizens' diplomacy, where each individual says, okay, I can become as it were, an ambassador from planet Earth to these civilizations with an understanding of what we might have in common. And the biggest thing we have in common is that they're conscious and sentient, and so are we. So what is the nature of mind? What is the nature of consciousness? How can that be experienced in a way that becomes increasingly universal and result in not only an operating system, such as our remote viewing and vectoring system, but also an understanding that no matter how different someone might look from us um, or how different their evolutionary track may have been, that at the core, the light of the spirit, the light of consciousness that is within that being is the same conscious mind that's within us. That point of, you know, sort of ineffable unity and oneness is the foundation for an entirely new uh, civilization on this planet that can become worthy of being an interplanetary civilization. So that's what we need to manifest and come together to create. And in the process of that, also find the courage to bring out the knowledge and the science and technology so that we get out of the 1800s. I mean, let's face it, you know, almost everything that we're using from electromagnetic waves to car engines to uh, trains to whatever it is are from the 1800s. Maybe jet engines that were used are from the 1930s uh, and rockets from the 1940s. So basically for the last 70 to 100 years, our civilization, notwithstanding all the ballyhoo about um, Silicon Valley, has been arrested in its technological development at a very deep and profound level. And that's a problem because then the consequence of that is that we have half the world's population living in poverty and at the same time, we're destroying the biosphere that we all depend on and that our children's children's children's, you know, uh, generations beyond us are going to depend on. So I think, you know, these are the big challenges that, that face us as opposed to endless, you know, fear-mongering and, and sort of ruminations about uh, who we need to be afraid of next. I think, I think really who we need is like, you know, what was that, the man in the mirror, you look in the mirror, who you need to be fr uh, afraid of is right here, it's us. And I think we have to sort of overcome our own fears and, and you know, sort of embrace our higher nature and our higher angels, uh, fully aware that we're all fallible and, and none of us are perfect, least of all me. But I think that we have to say, look, we can come together and do better than this. Um, and, and I think that the, 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 the mistake most people make is thinking that somehow this is going to be done by edict uh, out of the White House or the United Nations or some other place, uh, or that it's going to be something that is going to happen uh, from the top down. All big evolutionary leaps in human history have come from the ground up, from us, the people, we, the people.
Absolutely. No doubt about it. Let's go all the way to uh, the U.K. Let's get Johnny Webb, our special correspondent, having his eyes and ears to the ground over there, giving Third Phase of Moon exclusive uh, report from the United Kingdom UFO uh, sightings, uh, stories. Johnny Webb, any questions for Dr. Greer? Welcome to the show. Uh, good evening, Blake, uh, Dr. J, and uh, everyone else. Uh, Dr. Le uh, Dr. Greer, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi there. Um, I'd like to go back on a few points you spoke about in the first hour, um, which was the RTBR3 sightings, which right. was the original um, Belgium disclosure for their military. They, they were one of the first Europeans to disclose their UFO cases. And they used this Belgium, what I call a TBR3, from the typical look of it. We see them over Scotland and Paris. There's a very famous sighting on YouTube in Paris of that. And my question to you is, is were, were you suggesting that these these vehicles, these craft, are not actually alien, but they're owls? Not necessarily owls as in, like, the general public, but as in a secret program? You have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. So, so let me tell you how, how this works. If, you begin, if an event starts happening that is a certain number of people seeing an extraterrestrial object, let's say when, when General de Brouwer, the Belgian Air Force, that told us, and, and actually the Air Force loaned to us some really great night scopes when we went over there during that event to see this going on ourselves. They had uh, NATO radar stations and F-16s that were tracking an object that was going thousands of miles per hour straight up against gravity. But they also had eyewitnesses from their gendarme of an object that was over a little town that was this massive uh, sort of tet tetrahedral shape at, at the bottom end of it looked triangular, but very, very low, and it actually did not move off in a linear way. It collapsed into a into space into a throbbing orange-red sphere that was trans-dimensional and translucent, and then went straight out into space that way. So there are now are there a platforms? Let's call them that are man-made electromagnetogravitic, anti-gravity is the pop culture term, but it's really EMG, electromagnetogravitic, systems that could be triangular, disc-shaped, that could fool a casual observer. Well, in that sense, yes, of course. Now, what we have found is that often when there's a series of sightings or events that are ET in nature, classified programs will send in a man-made one just to confuse the picture or control the narrative. So it isn't, things get piggybacked on top of each other. So everyone wants to say it was either this or it's that, but sometimes it's a mix of both because the obfuscation is the name of the game in the intelligence community. And years ago, there was a national security agency director named General Odom, O-D-O-M, you can Google him, and his right-hand guy was someone I got to know who used to carry his briefcase and was all the meetings. And he's actually the guy who looked at the Marilyn Monroe document I have uh, from uh, the early 60s uh, about Marilyn Monroe, basically. It, it was basically her death warrant um, because she was going to disclose stuff that Kennedy had told her about the ET issue. But that's another story. The, the point I'm making is that this gentleman told me that they had something called DDT. And I said, well, yeah, that's this uh, toxic, you know, a pesticide, whatever. And he said, no, not that. We call it, <laughs> we set up uh, a decoy. It creates a distraction from the actual events, and then we trash the whole subject through doing that. So they can do that with documents. They can do that with aircraft sighting that are man-made, that can masquerade or hide some ET activity that's going on. They can do this, and it, it's called a DDT operation. And when he explained this to me, and that it's sort of, that's sort of a template or a sort of a, uh, a theme that goes through a number of famous UFO cases where it's this and then it becomes and it morphs to something else. And what happens is that it's not that they're not on top of these things. They certainly know uh, if, if it's beginning to break out into the media. And so there could be a situation where there are genuine ET events happening and then they'll do something that will make people think, well, this was a man-made event or an experimental aircraft. And people say, well, it wasn't that, it's this, when in reality, both things had happened. Now, a great example of that, although it's a more primitive one, was the, the original Roswell thing, where, of course, you know, this event happened, and then they said, well, look, here, we're going to drag out the remains of this weather balloon. 
Um, the same thing happened when I was in Phoenix in 1997 during the Phoenix Lights events, one of the biggest mass witnessed events. That, by the way, was the CE5. I had some people there, and we were doing a CE5 vector, and I was asking the ETs to do something that would be so amazing that it would make its way into the news, and we could get footage because I was doing a closed briefing for a whole bunch of members of Congress a couple weeks later in April, early April. So what happened, <laughs> this story kind of made strange credulity for people to hear it, but once that was happening, of course, it was seen in a huge area by thousands of people. Even Governor uh, Fight Simonson has eventually come clean that he ridiculed it when he had actually seen it and knew that it was amazing. But after that, they sent up aircraft. They dropped a whole bunch of flares. They had them floating down. They the kind, there are flares that will do this, and you can put them out in a pattern. And they said, well, that's what people were seeing. We were just doing that a little earlier. So this kind of a, a program that's designed to confuse the public is done uh, with great regularity. And I think that's why uh, you know, people get into these slugfests that, oh, it was this, no, it was that, and often it was both. And I think you know, there, there has to be sort of a deepening of awareness of, of um, how often that has happened in cases that are getting out of the control. Uh, as, as one guy who, who was tied into these um, uh, majestic programs said to me back in the early 90s, he said, he said, look, it's hidden in plain sight. But as soon as it starts coming out like that, we, you know, we just have to do a lot of stuff to divert people's attention, and they employ this DDT uh, strategy. And I liken this to, you know, there, there's these gold nuggets of actual amazing trans-dimensional ET events, yeah. and then they'll come in, these, these intelligence operatives, and they'll dump a mountain of fool's gold on top of it. And unfortunately, people aren't doing enough of an assay. They're not testing, is this gold or is it fool's gold? Is it real or is it Memorex? as the old commercial used to say. So I think that that's uh, one of the tasks that we have to, to, to undertake when, when all these things begin to happen is, is to understand that there's a multiplicity of phenomenon uh, that usually get called one thing. And we have to begin to realize that it's a little more um, involved than that, particularly since you're dealing with a, something where this is the biggest secret in the history of modern society. I mean, if you take the the uh, Wilbur Smith document, that's been an authenticated top secret document from Canada from uh, 1951, where it states that we're studying the modus operandi of these uh, things that were retrieved, and that this is the biggest secret in the history of the United States, transcending the secrecy of the development of the hydrogen bomb. I'm almost quoting from this document. Now, people, when they read that, they have to think for a minute. This was a year before we detonated the first hydrogen bomb. So for the, for the efforts attached to the subject to be more secret than the ultimate doomsday weapon, and we're talking now UFOs, that is an astonishing statement. But you have to then connect that to the fact that they were studying the modus operandi, the mechanism of action of these uh, vehicles, and that uh, a senior scientist at the Naval Research Labs that I've known for many years in Washington, it's the largest defense lab in the United States, um, told me that he was in, in, quote, the vault, and it is what it's called, and saw a document that in October 1954, before I was born, they had mastered what's called gravity control. So from 1954 up to you know the early 60s, they began to develop various types of these aircraft. Now, some people have felt that uh, Werner von Braun, Hermann Oberth, and others had knowledge of some of the, the things that uh, Adolf Hitler was working on all the way back to World War II and the Nazi era, that his secret weapon was actually these high-voltage electromagnetic anti-gravity platforms, whereas our secret weapon was the atomic bomb. And I, don't, I would not disagree with that. I think there, there's some good evidence that, in fact, going back to the 40s, there were experiments done uh, with this, but that it really would, had not gotten perfected by the end of World War II, but that a lot of that information began to then be complemented by the studying of uh, extraterrestrial vehicles that we had downed using electromagnetic scalar weapons back in the late 40s up to the current era, and that that potentiated the research and development greatly between 1947 and 1954. So that by you know the mid '50s onward, there were a number of things that were uh, seen 
and have been seen that are actually man-made, which the layperson could easily confuse to be uh, an extraterrestrial vehicle. And this is why the whole history and, and the study of this uh, it, it is really necessary uh, to be able to make any kind of decision on any given case that gets reported. And a lot of times, as I said earlier, a case will be reported. There's just simply not enough information and data from people who were there to know uh, whether it was, you know, ours, uh, another civilization's, or what. You know, Dr. Greer, uh, a while back, a few years ago, I was discussing with a friend uh, why they're hiding this knowledge from us of these extraterrestrials. And he told me that it's not necessarily about uh, we're afraid of them or we can't handle the truth, but more so because of the technology. And you proved that in, in the movie Sirius. And 